Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's been an inspiring set of talks. I've been learning a lot. What I hope to do in my presentation is take you to settings and to people that you perhaps do not really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a world that's been left behind by the digital revolution a long time ago, a world that probably lags behind where we are in terms of adoption of technology and in any useful uh, application of technology, maybe they are behind like 30 years, right? So a little bit about myself first. So about 15 years ago, this book was all the rage, right? And I drank the Kool-Aid that you could use technology and business as a force for good. And I went on to build two social enterprises. I grew up in sem semi-rural India, spent a decade in the US, went back, built a rural solar energy startup. Uh, and then a medical device startup. Embrace came out of Stanford. Uh, we were asked to build a cheap incubator. We were students of design thinking, so obviously we did the user research. Found out that what's actually the challenge is skill, infrastructure, maintenance. So we built an infant warmer that worked without power and anyone could use with almost no training. Did that lead to impact? No. Uh, when I came on board, we had more awards than we had customers. Right? My journey was that of actually getting the very first doctors to use the product, convince them to use it, even after clinical trials. Right? And that journey progressed through one state government at a time, one pilot at a time, to 25 countries, including uh, Syrian refugee camps. We touched almost half a million babies, old slide. Sorry, I just cut and paste. Uh, but I came to believe that products and technology alone does not lead to impact. We got to work with a very complex set of stakeholders as part of the systems to make a difference, truly lasting difference. And that takes a very radical approach. But first, let's see why that's the case. Anyone know what's happening here? Yeah, so this is a data entry operator at a primary health center in India, and he's entering data that's two months old because this, someone sent back this Excel sheet to him saying this data is still missing, and he's looking at records from uh, what are called a &M, auxiliary nurse, midwives, handwritten notes, and he's entering that data. So I don't really think we can have participatory ML unless we pull in stakeholders we do not normally think of. Administrators sitting at the top of the decision-making chain who have absolutely no clue. These are the same administrators that have made decisions on digital technologies that remain siloed today. Right? There are departments in India that will tell you they have 60 different silos of technology that do not talk to each other. Right? You have implementers. You saw the guy on the ground. Right? What, are, what are his limitations? Domain research, medical and public health research goes on. Our agriculture research goes on, often a little separate from all these guys. You have pest alert definitions that aren't really implementable on the ground. So if technologists, that folks in the room, really want to have an impact, we got to work together with these stakeholders. Right? And uh, fortunately for me, I got an opportunity to, to scratch that itch. When Wadwani AI was founded about 18 months ago, we are an international nonprofit uh, research institute and global hub for building AI solutions for social good. And uh, our current focus areas are really about how do we use AI to power universal healthcare at the front lines, right? When I say front lines, there are no facilities. You're talking about homes and communities, right? How do we eliminate tuberculosis, which kills more people today than HIV and malaria together? Right? And how do you double small farmers' income? There are 500 million of them around the world, probably still the largest generator of employment and livelihood. Right? But what we found ourselves doing is, as much as we started working on these specific challenges within these you know, uh, what we call very large focus areas, we found ourselves having to invest a lot of time doing thought leadership. 
and really basic training for organizations such as the UNDP, right, UNITU, Government of India. We, in fact, helped write uh, India's AI strategy, and we also continue to do training. So we got to start there before we can actually sit with these stakeholders and build useful AI. And this is, in some sense, our worldview. We got to work within, work with, and maybe to start with within the scale systems that already exist if you want to have impact at scale, right? Now, how do we pick our challenges? This is a framework that we use. It's not good enough to ask, is this a big problem? Because there are so many big problems. You got to ask, is AI really going to make a big difference? And we say AI-based solutions because Guess what? That water is not get de getting delivered by AI. These are AI-based solutions, right? Unless you can upload sewage and download water, <laughs> you know, we live in a physical world, right? And ultimately, you got to work with a la lot of stakeholders. The beneficiary is different from the user, is different from the chooser, is different from the payer, right? That's the world we live in if you really want to reach these, uh, the bottom five billion. And of course, we find that data is often not good enough. So we have to uh, find ways to build data that's actually usable, get partner organizations that we can co-create with, including getting that data. And just like maybe companies building LiDAR don't build LiDARs without engaging with the likes of Toyota about self-driving cars and where that's going, because that's the scale to that technology, to that product. We engage with the scalers of social programs to figure out whether if we were to build a solution, how would this actually scale and bring them, the, bring them to the table early on. All right, so let's go to a couple of uh, things we are working on. Anyone know what I'm looking at? Any guesses? Just yeah, these are birth weights, right? Uh, see anything weird? Yeah, four out of six are the same. They are all two and a half, and that's because that's normal birth weight, and if it's less than that, that's additional work for the community health worker, right? And of course, note, babies are born at perfectly 0.5 kg intervals, right? right? Uh, and this is what's called a diary of an ASHA worker, a community health worker, who makes home visits. We have these elaborate programs for home-based newborn care, where they visit home every, every week for the first six weeks. And look at the weights. So now, if you do not know how this data is coming together, how is it useful in a dashboard form? How do you know which babies you're missing, right? And when low birth weight babies have a 20 times greater risk of death within the first month, right, and risk of illness throughout life, and if we do not even weigh properly 50% of low birth weight babies, how are we going to fix it? But let's build some empathy for our users. So that's a spring balance. We've been sending that out for maybe three decades now, right? Took three women to load that baby, and maybe she got it right, maybe she didn't. We don't know what she writes down finally. It's difficult, right? And these things break down. So we asked, could we build a virtual weighing machine? These folks forget spring balances, but they don't seem to forget their phones, <laughs> right? And more and more programs are already equipping them with basic smartphones. And not only weight, how about other critical parameters that folks don't even attempt to measure these days, right? And dot, 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 dot. Video as a window to health. I mean, phone-based video as a win window to health. What else could we measure? And the beauty, if we were to be able to do that, is not only do you have verifiability and accountability, you actually simplify the overall system. We are not building a separate app. This actually gets integrated into any app with the dashboards and, if, and all the workflows, et cetera. 
And we are happy to report, we've actually gotten just some breakthrough results where we are, what you're seeing is actually a full 3D reconstruction of a baby with just a single frame. And the baby, the 3D model is moving as the baby is moving. These are, these are images from a hospital setting where we just did our first field experiments. Another one. But really, what we're excited about is using these really bad basic smartphone-based images, we are actually able to do 3D reconstruction, right? Now, first, why 3D models? One of the reasons we chose that approach is it allows a certain explainability. Turns out, weight varies just, I mean, weight or volume, density varies just 3%. So if you get volume, you get weight, right? Uh, and once you have a 3D model, we can explain what's happening to the doctors. What, what, how, how are you getting at this weight, right? Uh, two, birth weight classification is just the first use case for this. Anthropometry has many other applications, and hence it's a very useful thing to develop as a technology, right? So growth tracking during those first six weeks that the ASHA is visiting home, Right? You could actually track the uh, weight of the baby, track the baby's other developmental uh, indicators, perhaps. Right? And that's where we are going. <clears throat> Couple of things I want to call out. Uh, data collection, types and diversity of settings. Uh, what you're seeing is, I mean, these are, these are footwear of parents or caretakers of hundreds of babies that are in that facility. This facility sees 1,500 babies a month, right? It's Nilofer in Hyderabad, and we work closely with the government of Telangana, uh, as well as the medical college that actually operates this to collect this data. With, it, with ethics committee approvals, IRB oversight, uh, you know, informed consent in local language, and all that, right? Then you can imagine also issues such as uh, What's the natural distribution of babies you get in a data collection like this versus what's the distribution of the data you need for your training to be robust, right? So these are all the issues we deal with there. Few other things. Uh, risk of misclassifying babies as low birth weight baby, let's say, right? I mean, you, so let's, let's imagine these categories. Very low birth weight, below one and a half. Low birth weight, below two and a half. And normal birth weight, two and a half or above. Right Now, which boundaries are you going to take risks in which direction? Right? Is it okay to misclassify a baby as normal birth weight if it's low birth weight? Right? What about the cost of someone having to lug their baby out right, uh, to a facility if I misclassify and you know, overstate the risk? So these are some really important trade-offs for our product managers and our program folks. Accuracy as it relates to the use case. Classification, maybe I don't need that great accuracy. But if I'm talking growth rate, where you need to be able to track 100 grams of weight increase, let's say, over a week's time, now that needs to be a lot more sensitive. And last but not the least, uh, AI as a medical device is a very new construct in the minds of this community. And we are actually working with them to figure out how would you evaluate AI as a medical device. Another thing we are working on, uh, TB cascade of care. I will not go into detail here, but we are, we are actually the official AI partner for India's national TB program. Uh, and we are working on challenges from finding what you call the missing millions of TB patients to screening and triaging to actually treatment and uh, adherence. Let's switch to cotton. Uh, while I'm on this slide, I do want to call out, do talk to my colleague Rajesh here, who heads our agriculture work. Uh, he's le leading this project. He comes with three decades of experience working in agriculture programs. Um, and one of the things we found very useful is actually have a diversity of experiences within the team. We have AI research, engineering, 
product design and programs, and programs is a word we borrow from the world of government and nonprofits and international organizations. Now, 250 million people still depend on cotton. If you folks know history, cotton was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution 160 years ago, right? Turns out, still a lot of people depend on it. And in India, especially, uh, we found that it's at the heart of farmer distress. It's the third largest crop. 30 million people depend on it. And there have been a spate of suicides. Now, these are very complex challenges, but one specific challenge we thought we should address was avoidable pest loss, right? If you notice, this cascade actually starts here with inputs, but in reality, it starts with financial inclusion and ends with market access and goes beyond agriculture, right? And this is often a very important way to look at challenges, else we'll build very narrow AI that doesn't lead to enough impact. If you don't recognize, well, you know what? Now I'm going to diagnose more patients so they're going to show up at health facility that does not have any way of dealing with them, right? Similarly, there are cascades everywhere. And these are smallholder farmers. They do not use smartphones for the most part. And they get all their advice from large-scale agriculture programs. They depend on field staff or lead farmers who, in many programs, actually report pest data manually. They go out there, look at pest traps in what's called monitoring Field, uh, mo uh, uh, monitoring plots or demo plots, count them, identify them, and send it to an expert who sends an advice back. That usually may take a week to two weeks. And because they don't know which of this data are actually accurate, they use some averages to send out average advice. You people in 100 villages, all of you take paracetamol at once. Not going to work, right? So we have actually start, started building AI. OK, this is not auto-playing. Am I going to the next one? No. Can someone help me play this? All right, so let's skip if that's not playing. What we're, there is this practice of using pest traps already. And we are equipping extension staff and lead farmers with AI that, integra that integrates with apps they are already using. So that when they take a photograph, we detect and count pests and give them instant advice, but also link them with the program. For example, you know, call your local officer if you have a high alert. right? Let's see how this works. This is a demo that we very quickly did at office. Sorry, I don't have a better video. I don't know what pests those are. Let's see. We've actually compressed these models to now work offline uh, because you know connectivity is a big challenge. So hi, American ballworm infestation. Call your local officer. Now, <clears throat> how should we present our results? Should we show the count? Should we show those, those green boxes and every pest identified? Is that too much information? Is it going to confuse them? Should we show it not to farmers, but maybe we should show it to the uh, field staff who knows better and can verify the results? Is that how we build in human in the loop? What should we do when we are actually deploying this for two million farmers across one huge state? So these are the sort of things we are grappling with, and I'm looking forward to learn from your experiences. Uh, so uh, just a second. There's also this whole area of trust in this that's a, that's a little different from how you might think. Currently, trust in this space comes from not machines or advice, but from the human that the farmers actually interact with. So they especially depend on lead farmer and this field staff. So they might ignore all sorts of advice, but if these people tell them this is what you need to do, that's where their trust actually comes from. So our initial deployments are with these people, but how do we think about trust in the long term is something we are grappling with. 
So to summarize, we got to co-create with stakeholders, look at systems, be aware of the cascade of issues, think very carefully about the data needs as we build AI. Remember there are accuracy trade-offs based on the use case and the setting. Oops. And of course, trust and explainability and how that plays out really changes with the users. You might have the same AI at the background, but if you're catering to multiple users, right, uh, in a hierarchy, how would you deal with that? So if you are interested in building AI for the next five billion, come work with us. We are looking for folks with your background, right? We have porous walls, so we collaborate openly. All our work will be free for social good use, right? So we are looking for everyone from people to come and take full-time jobs, to inter internships, to externships, fellowships, collaborations, right? Two specific things I want to call out. Uh, to help the stakeholders we are working with, we are just thinking through how do we create a policy and ethics lab so that instead of trying to really boil the ocean, we at least create sandboxes for these regulators to come participate in, right? And open up maybe small portions of their ecosystem to work with us to create meaningful AI, right? And figure out how to deal with data. And of course, AI hub for social good. Uh, there aren't enough organizations or enough people with data and AI background working on these really important challenges, right? Be it universal healthcare, eliminating TB, or doubling farmers' income. So come collaborate with us. We are establishing this AI for Social Good Hub. That's my email. That's my partnerships team's email. Thank you. <laughs>